Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have a, a guy here who has played for me, hard player, hard worker, um, doing some great things right now, always saw the potential and uh, can't wait to get all his information. We had someone in the interviews before mention the type of work he did for mm -hmm. him on his youth club. And um, there's another clip from Metro Lions. So oh, Mr. Dennis, you're not gonna be the only one on the Metro Lions that are on the circuit now. So I'll ask you to introduce yourself and um, say from what age you came here and how you get into the game. Well, you know, I'm Paul Akumu, um, originally from Uganda. I came here um, at the age of 10, you know, I had to leave back home because of the coup. There was a coup, a coup de tête. You know, most people know what that is, civil war. So we left, I, you know, we had to run the country. We ran and, you know, through the bushes and all that, you know, people, what you think about Africa was true. Um, lived in Kenya for three, four years. That's where I really picked up my game and learned how to play. So I came here when I was 10, always had a passion for the game. I wanted to play professionally so I could go back home and help people. And I left all my siblings. I came here with my brother, and his family so I always felt alone always by myself so can when I, I came here, what year you came i came here in 1987 okay and all right yeah. so 9 9 10 so 9 80s, I'm, a, I'm a may baby so yeah so did you get into, how you got into the sport what what was toronto life i know you came from that type of turmoil in, at home to try i remember i remember actually it was in march we flew into pearson all I remember from after that, we're in Windsor. I remember taking a holiday in across the river. We used to wake up every morning, just watch TV, go down for breakfast for about a month or so. I remember we're in Windsor. We lived there for about six months and there was nothing happening. I went to school there for a little bit and then we moved to Toronto. Yeah. Okay. So we ended up moving I, to Toronto. Did you notice the difference with Windsor at that time and Toronto? Windsor, Windsor is the same. You know, when I, when I listen to Alfonso Davis' story, it's the same thing. It seems like every time as foreigners or immigrants, when you come here, they take you to Windsor first. <laughs> so, because Alfonso Davis went to Windsor too. Yeah. And then they were, so yeah. But Windsor, it was cold. We we're staying in a hotel. It was different. It was a small city. When I came to Toronto, it was almost, your eyes were open to this big world. You know, we live right downtown. I remember Dukes of Canuck, right downtown. You know, the art gallery. I live right on, um, we end up living down by uh, Beverly and Dundas. Oh, that's the heart of the, yeah. Heart of downtown, close, <laughs> close yeah. to the art gallery. But I had to walk to school. I went to school at Bathurst and Queen. So Beverly is, Mary. Just, Beverly is just west of University, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Right. But I had to go to school at uh, St. Mary's, which is a Bathurst and Queen. It was a long walk. We were walking. There was no school bus. You had to walk there. Winter, summer, you're walking. Then my cousin lived at Regent Park. So we used to go hang out with them at Regent Park. Yeah, And I guess this is where the story of football takes place because that's where I met Dexter and Lucky. And, and Dexter... Oh, so that's Dexter Gilmore? Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, you know what? I can't tell. I forgot Dexter's last name, but yeah, it's Lucky would know him. Gilmore. Gilmore? Yeah. He was a judge. So Dexter and Lucky kind of took us in. Dexter was like, you know what? You're a good baller. You play ball. Dude. I need to get you to a club. We should just play in the community center. We're just young kids. A whole bunch of us. All so you were about what, 13, 12, 13, 14 then? Or? No, at that time I was 10. You're turning 10, you're turning 11. Okay, so it's fresh. Still young, 11. Still fresh. Yeah, we, yeah from, from Beverly, I walked to Regent Park. Because it, you, it, we had no fear at that time because I came here. I've been through a war. This was nothing. To walk to Regent Park was not a big deal. Okay. So Yeah, so we go we play ball at Regent Park, play at Pape, Pape Community Center. And Dexter is done to put me on. He put me on to East York. He got me into in touch with a coach at East York. I played only, honestly, maybe three months with East York. I played in the East York tournament. We won. But then the family had moved to Beverly, so it was hard for me to go back to East York. And from there, I used to just go play in the park. There's a park behind our, the house there. So I just used to go play there every day in the summertime. And then one kid, a kid saw me playing. I remember the kid, his name, Peter Wharton. White boy from England, from England. 
the family owned a restaurant around the corner. He saw me playing. He's like, oh, you play ball? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to come try out for my team? I said, sure, why not? So the guy, you know, took me to Dixie. Ooh. I was like, he, 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 he goes, he goes, you want to come play with me? I play at Dixie. I said, where's Dixie? I didn't, I didn't know. I said, sure. Yeah. I said, let me just go home. I'm going to get my, I'm going to go just tell them I'm leaving. I'm going to go play soccer. Gone to Dixie. I don't know this guy. His parents drive me. I have no clue. Went to Dixie and Dixie was an eye opener. That's where I realized started getting to organize, really organize football here. I met Dave Mancini and, you know, Dominic Comiso, Shane, Shane Griffin, Shane, who's now was a TD at, at Milton, became some of my good friends because that's where I ended up meeting them. Down the road, I ended up meeting Rumba, Rumba Mentali, because it was just, that's where I started off and just took somebody just seeing me playing and helping me out. Okay. So now, ladies and gentlemen, this guy in this fraternity now, he's doing wonders. So we're going to take it slow. And you, I, I want to be <laughs> sure because he played, for me, he played for me and I got him at a certain time. So I'm learning this early stages too because we never had the time to talk about these things. And um, so from the Dixie, what, how did you start going into real competitive being seen like your teens and stuff because when i met you in metro lions i would suspect you were about in your early 20s yeah i just graduated university so that's when i just first came back um so what happened between then and then because i know um you were with your uncle i think was um um i forgot his name oyo yeah 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 uh, right. nobles nobles yeah tony tony or ten yeah uh, you're right, but no, what, no you did before, that, yeah. what you did before that, what you did before that, because Paul, the way you play, I know you must uh, do some damage between that, <laughs> that teens to when I met you. Well, Where did you represent? You stayed with Dixie all the way till, till oh, um, Metro Lands? Didn't stay with Dixie all the way through. I mean, they ended up moving to Chinkuzi and, you know, you know, you know, life was tough, you know, because things happen and, and, they moved to Chinkuzi. My brother moved the family up to Markham. So it was harder for me to get there for training. I went for a little bit. Didn't work out then. I ended up actually playing for Scarborough, Missouri, for Errol Grant. Okay. Played for, played for Mr. Grant for a bit. You know, he, he took me under his wings. Actually, Tony D, actually, I recruited me to come and play. So I was actually going to play for Malvern. Went to training and everything. It was good. But then we had an age group that year when the ages changed. And then, yeah, Daryl Gomez and all these guys came down and, and you know, and um, when they came down, it changed the whole dynamic of football for us. So then I stayed with Scarborough Zuri. We had a good time. I remember the rivals we had at Clare Lee. We beat them that one indoor season. You know, Mark Smith was on our team. It was a, it was a great rivalry between Malvern and Scarborough Zuri. I played for a couple of years. I played for Wexford. And I, honestly, I ended up getting my scholarship with Wexford. And... Um, and I played for Chinkuzi at U19 for Ken Dawson for a few months, but it was all Melbourne players, all Kareem, and we all went to Melbourne. Jamal, we ended up going to Chinkuzi just to go play to try and get scholarships. There you so go. So I kind of I kind of bounced around, but I think after Dixie, no Scarborough Azuri, Scarborough Azuri was the team that kind of kept me. Mr. Grant kind of kept me because he used to pick us up and and that kind of gave me a passion also for football. I remember him and my Dixie coach, Ronato. Renato was from Uruguay. And I remember we were in Florida. He's the one that actually kept me. He, he actually gave me a passion to actually go back and coach because he took care of me. He took care of me as one of his players and one of his kids. Like my parents, my family was never in my life. They never watched me play. Up to this day, no one in my family has really watched me play football. Whoa. That's, never that's, watched me play. You see? So, yeah, yeah. No lie. Nobody. They watched me play. You know what? I actually watched one game. It's, they watched one game, and it was actually on TV. It was it was one of the Metro Lions games. I think we were playing at um. That's why you were after me for footage. I remember one yeah. time you made a request for me to um, and I still remember that request. And all years later, and I think that your family never saw you play. I see you play. I didn't know the, even the reason for your request, so, but I remember you requesting if I had any game Metro Lions game. Yeah, they, they never. My family is never really supported. I mean, an African family, they didn't think about sports as a big thing. So, you know, nobody ever watched me play it. The one game they watched, I think we were playing a game 
and if I remember, I don't know, it wasn't Esther Shannon, maybe Birchmont Stadium was a game, and it was it was on it was on Rogers, Rogers 10, Channel 10. Mm-hmm. The game was on TV with our family barbecue. I decided to so let me go watch just TV. I turned the game on, the game is on. So I'm watching the game and everybody's talking about, oh, there's football. You know, African families, yeah. black families, they come watch. Everybody's like, oh, there's football on. So they start watching. Like, so my brother's like, hey, that looks like you. Is that you? I was like, yeah, that's me. They're like, what? That's you playing on TV? <laughs> and they, that's the only game they ever watch. So so you owe me big time. Yeah. I have to take copyright and everything for that that success now. So I, I, would, yeah. I, would, I would stay with Dexter Gilmore. No problem. Guys now, right? Make sure I get a little plug with these guys now. Absolutely. Get to the Mestro Lands now because we got a lot with you, Paul. Um, yeah. You did well. Um, how how did you get into this Metro Lions? Um, I remember a certain situation with you where in meeting you, I remember the previous coach was setting you up for me to release you and stuff. And um, I don't know mm-hmm. if you could recall yeah, yeah, you was... having, he thought you were um, disrespectful or whatever, but I didn't see it at all. And I was right there privy to the whole situation. So I don't know what transpired before my time, but I knew the way you are spoken, you speak your mind. You know, you, you you know, if you see it a certain way, and that was a good trait. So I didn't have a problem with you. Yeah, no, bitch, but that said and done, like you just said, it's me speaking my mind. And for me, I felt at times that it was, they were, they were trying to play favoritism. But, you know, if it was favoritism, I, I could tell you, like, I remember I had trials. I just finished university. My, my uncle, who was actually, who started the club. So he's Noble's uncle as well, Noble Kellum playing for TFC now. That's his mm-hmm. uncle. He started a club with 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 this with this um with the owner and he called me in the university and said, Paul, are you finished? I said, yeah. I said, well I have some tryouts. You know, I had tryouts. I was at Cincinnati Riverhawks. I went down to Charleston Battery. I had a few tryouts in the A League. And I played some good games. I played against Columbus crew. Cincinnati wanted to sign me. You know, so then, you know, he calls me, he said, come back and play for me. We got a club here we're starting we're going to be in the professional league here, Canadian professional league. You get paid. I said, okay, if I could come back and play for my uncle, why not? And Patrick, me and Patrick, so he introduced me to Patrick Tobin. Patrick was there, so he called me back again. And I'd known Patrick prior to that. So I was like, oh, Patrick Tobin's also involved? No problem. So that's how I came back and I came to Metro Lions. But then the coach that they brought in to lead the team now, the same guy that, yeah. you know, got let go. We're there training hard, working hard. And he's treating guys, and I remember him, he's taking a lot of, because he coached high school soccer here too. So he's taking guys from the high school thinking that, I said, we're seasoned guys. I go, I played four years NCAA, big ball, played against some big teams, some professional guys even right now. I could play. So he, he just he just didn't give us the respect. And for me, it was more so because my uncle and Patrick backed me up. So he didn't, he didn't give me that respect. But I was like, I don't need them to back me up. I'll show you my work ethic. I'll work hard for my position. I said, I played center mid when I was, was in university. And I came to Metro Lanza. I was playing right fullback. I was okay with it because I had O'Neal Brown beside me and I had Baker on the other side. Yeah. I was good. And there was no problem. I could go up and down. There was no problem. So I had no issue with it. But, you know, he took issue with that. And he said, oh, you speak your mind. And because you talk, because I always talk back. I said, if it's not right, is there something not right? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Paul, and one of the things I also knew is that you knew more than me about the organization. You were there before mm-hmm. me. And mm-hmm. my impression with, you know, being part of that organization, it seemed that they were cleaning out a certain um, personnel, mm-hmm. including your uncle. I, and, and I know you mentioned your uncle to me, but I didn't have a clue what happened with your uncle. I, I knew I he, was a little, he was a little disjointed because another black person was moving up in the organization, but they could have never used me against him, right? right. To this day, I still have that respect for him. So, right. but I can't control what they set out to do contractually and who was in charge and all that. I, I was just facilitating and got a job to do something and I decide I'm going to keep you. Now, mm. I did not know you were on scholarship. So how did the scholarship, where you got the scholarship from? Connect the dots from 
So you want to hear who you got this scholarship from? Oh man, when I say that, I mean, I get back in the because day. Because it's you know, scholarship because in going to that part of your career where you're coaching now, you're in charge of programs. Mm -hmm. And I want to draw that link that you have a certain amount of experience being right. a scholarship too, because one of the things we revealed with MacGyver and Johnny and these guys, the scholarship thing, I want young people to be aware of the challenges and everything else with the scholarships and how we go about it. And so whatever experience you could pass on towards getting the uh, scholarship and stuff, it will be, you know, beneficial to people listening and young people listening. No, no absolutely. I remember um, for me during the time back then, you could play for multiple teams. We used to jump and play Spanish league and play here, play there. I remember one of my best friends who was living with it at that time because I had a rough growing upbringing. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a lot of my friends of these guys where you live at home, you have mom and dad. Like I was on my own from 15 paying rent. I was on welfare paying rent. So I remember at one point I lived with um, my good friend, Aaron Benjamin. You know, you live with Aaron Benjamin? Aaron Benjamin, yeah, I live with Aaron. Miss Erica let me stay with them. Well, so me, and Aaron, me, me, me and Aaron were roommates, and we, you know, we, we, you know, we, we kind of hung out together. For so, the public consumption so nowadays, this gentleman, gentleman is talking, talking about Feto Sun. For you in the Caribbean community, Aaron Benjamin big, is Feto Sun. Big yeah. baller. Still yeah. one of my best friends. We still talk up to this day. You know, me and Aaron were roommates for a couple of years. So, you know, we, we, so at that point, when I was injured and when I, Aaron's like, you know, encouraging, we used to go to the gym together. Aaron, Aaron was playing for North York, Missouri. So, you know, he was getting offers and I'd go and i go to tournaments in North York, Missouri. I got a couple offers here and there. Nothing really panned out. And then I just remember one day out of the blue, I don't even know how it came back to Tony D. Tony D gave me a sheet, like two, two pages of sheets. It was like, yo, these are schools. He goes, Paul, you want to go on scholarship? Because Tony was always, Tony always liked me. All right. Because he, he also wanted me to play for him. Tony liked me. He was so we we're cool. So Tony D's like, Pa, you wanna you wanna go to school? You wanna go to scholarship? You have good grades? I say, yeah, Tony. He goes, no problem. He goes, here, call him schools there. You know, if you call all these schools and you go, I'll I'll be your reference. I said, okay. He goes, all these schools are recruiting, doing, you know, doing ain't going to do ain't going to do ain't going to school, doing playing professional. I said, no problem, Tony. I said, thank you, Tony. I took the schools, I started calling schools. I remember I'd go to the library. When I was at McGivney, I go to the library, ask the, ask the librarian if I could use the internet to search the schools. He got type www. Da, 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 da. You have to everything in there. <laughs> I spent hours in there, emailing coaches, calling coaches, buy a calling card, call coaches. And then, you know, the coach, a few coaches responded. I got a call from Columbia University. I didn't know. Back then, I was deciding on schools based on where you're, because for me, I want to go somewhere warm. Columbia was in New York. I was like, nah, I ain't going to New York. New York is like Toronto, it's too cold. So that's what I was deciding. Yeah, and, yeah. But I had no guidance. Nobody was guiding me. I made a mistake. But, well, not a mistake, but finally I got it. One of the schools, South Carolina called me back, said, yo, come down for a visit. I had no money. I didn't know how I was going to go visit. They weren't paying for me. They didn't pay for us back then. So I was like, okay. So then I told my friend, Steven, Steven Lawrence. So Steve's like, yeah, man, I'll come down with you. Let's go. So Steve asked his mom and Steve's mom paid for me. She bought us a, I remember a Greyhound ticket, $180. Me and Steve got in the Greyhound, 28 hours to South Carolina. Whoa. Two of us. 28 hours on the bus. It was the craziest thing ever. Go down. When we, we're there in winter jackets. When we get out to South Carolina, we're stripping because it's so hot. Yeah, and it was it was like February. It was like February, so it was so hot. We went down, we had our tryouts. The coach loved us, made us offers right there. So he made me an offer. I said, "Well, great, no problem." He goes, "Full, he, full scale." Part of me was it a full scale or he it, pretty much he gave me it was a full ride. All I had to pay was two thousand dollars, which was like I think it was just for my um my books and some stuff. It was like two thousand dollars, so right. I got a pretty much a full ride. Yes, yeah. So. You know, they love me and it was, so I ended up spending four years there. But, you know, in about four years, the team wasn't the greatest, you know. But I love the atmosphere. I love the coach. Then I started talking to him, said, listen, 
I want a, a winning team. I want to bring my friends. So my second or third year, I gave away some of my money to bring my, my friends over. So I brought Quincy Cooper. Quincy came. Stephen Lawrence ended That's up coming there. That's you go close with Quincy. I'm the one who got Quincy to my school. What do you mean? I gave up my scholarship. You got my scholarship in money. Lands too. Yep. I gave up my scholarship money to get Quincy there because I knew that at least we could have a good team. I said, my boys in Toronto are good. They can play. So for me, it was always about winning, but also can I help my friends? You know, like part, partly I went to the school there. I remember that's the time when Julian had just gone to, to Marseille and Dwayne was going pro. Dwayne was my good friend at that time. I knew Julian because actually when I got injured at 15, I was coaching Julian team when he was at North Scarborough. We used to go to West Hill. They were training at West Hill, so I used to go stop, and train them. Stop, Paul. You were coaching that long? Yeah, man. Okay. I'm telling you, well, it, 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 that's what I got introduced into coaching. Yeah. Because because I was, I was having, I was doing a recovery. So for me, the recovery was I got to train with them, with their team. So I knew Julian and I knew, um, what's his name? Um, Kareem. So that's how I got to know them. But Kareem Morgan and all of them. So I was training them, but I, I could play with them so I could recover. So th And then I think maybe a few months after that, Julian left. So that was part of my recovery. I, started, I got into the little vibe of coaching. And so when I got my scholarship, I went away. My first year, my coach made me start coaching right away. So I used to do these camps. And then I started staying there in the summertime for, uh, I used to do summertime camps and I used to coach clubs. And I just started doing since then. Wow. All this before I met you. All this before. Yeah, yeah. Wow. All of that. It, it, wow. it, it built a vibe. It built a vibe for coaching and a love for it, a passion to give back because so many people helped me along the way. When I look at Dexter, the first boots I got from this white family when we came, a secondhand pair of Copas that lasted me three years, you know, like yeah, getting help from them, getting help from Tony D, getting help from Stephen Lawrence's mom. You know, Mrs. Lawrence helped me out, but that the buy me that Greyhound ticket alone helped me get my scholarship. You know, um, remember Mike, Mike McConnell from Wexford helped me out a lot. Mike McConnell, I played for my Wexford, he helped me out a lot. You know, like this. So many people that have helped me out through my life. You know, my high school, one of our high school teachers used to bring me for therapy when I got injured at 15. I had knee surgery. She used to take me for therapy for me, give me. So people have helped, touched and helped me. So for me, the coaching aspect now, coming back around to your question even about the coaching, that's why I still do it and the passion I have. Okay. Seeing so these kids succeed. Let's hit the metro lands and slide into that same coaching <laughs> now because so you did well in the you're doing well in the coaching metro lands now i met you as i said it was either keep you or cut you yeah i was cutting you know good players you know i had to trim in terms of you know we were starting to have either go up or go down right yeah. and um I found the discipline was a little problem. So if I found discipline was a problem, we were showing. You were mm -hmm. thing Because in terms of different discipline, regardless where anybody say you had that. Mm -hmm. that you used to get 110 and stuff. So on my on, in my roster, you're always there. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I can tell you right now is it's it's a pleasure to have you on on this Pre system, right? Appreciate so, appreciate that. So, so you're into the lines now. You saw you were there before me. How you look at that whole situation, the the turnover of the team, unfortunate stuff with your uncle, we passed that. Yeah, yeah. You came in and and now you didn't have to worry, you look over your shoulder because whoever was looking to get rid of you were gone. And this is why I would have found very unfair, not knowing your history, as you just told the public. For you not to got that opportunity in Metro Lands would have been very unfair. And I felt no. so even in knowing your short time mm -hmm. and, and even worse now in knowing your history. So how you felt and you stayed, so how you look at the team gelling together and, and how you look at, because you know the Montreal order war was the whole thing. Oh, it, I remember it, that one. You yeah, know yeah. we had to get rid of some players, very good, very good players, players. Wrong nothing wrong with the players. players. Remember, these were elite, really good players. I have nothing bad to say about their ability, but we need to mm. gel. So how you look no. at the gelling? No, no. The, the, I mean, the gelling was... I mean, ballers, people have to come in. Once you have a, the same goal 
and you have the same vision, then we have to come together and try to make it happen. I mean, the guys came together and we did what we had to do. Um, for me, at the end of the day, like even even forget watching my shoulder. For me, I was like, if we put forth the work, like I remember I used to run, even when we got the, um, when Gordon came in and was coaching us, fitness, for me, I was like, guys, we got to get fit. And, and, and to me, that was part of the gelling. I remember even with Courtney, like Courtney, like I remember we had issues. I met him in high school. I didn't even know. And me and him actually even, I don't even really duked it out, but me and Courtney weren't, because uh, I'd fight. Yeah, you, I'd fight you, were strong. You, you both strong, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'd fight everybody. You know, I didn't care. You talked to me. I was like, listen, I don't, I go, you're going to beat me up, but you're going to get a mark on you. You're going to remember who you fought. Even if you beat me up, you're going to remember that you fought Paulo Kumu. So I, I never really backed down from anybody. I remember Courtney in high school, but when we met back together at Metro Lions, Courtney used to pick me up. Courtney was my ride. Courtney used to bring me to training, to games. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was my guy. Give me a ride. Because he also realized, though, this guy's here just to play and to ball. He's going to work hard. Courtney's like, okay, this guy's my, in my back. I'm going to tackle. I'm going to give you the ball. You go do your thing. So, you know, th that, that gelling in that relationship, and it even took me a while even for me to gel with O'Neal. So I remember that background between my, myself, O'Neal, Baker, and, and uh, Drake Sinet. With Drake yeah. to the back, like, it was solid. Uh, we did, came did, together uh, and said, did, um, what's his name? Um, and then Kirk. Ricketts. Kirk, Kirk, Kirk Ricketts. Yeah, Kirk, Kirk. Kirk, Kirk came in after too, so Kirk was there too. But yeah, but but it was like, but we gelled and there was no jealousy. Everybody just worked hard. Everybody wanted the best for the team. So that was, that was such a beautiful ex experience. I, and I... I've never experienced it that way. I remember even after Metro Lions going to Astros with Bruno, it was like, Astros was good. We pl I played against Mexico. I played against Chico. I had to cover Chicorito and, and, and Dos Santos. And I was like, but it was a different experience. Mm -hmm. we, we, ne we never really, the team never really gelled and came together as that Metro Lions team. That, I mean, it's unfortunate the league folded, but I think that team would have been a team to reckon with for years to come. Yeah, you guys are close. We we were a legal entity. And, and to be honest with you, um, it was a black entity. Uh, yeah. You know, when, when I was there. Now, after Metro Lions, I sought you out again. I, uh, Caribbean Stars affiliated with North Scarborough. Yeah. MJ, I know how to talk a lot of you guys down because <laughs> MJ is a low level, ladies and gentlemen. And these guys, I had to talk to them to come and help out this or the club, yeah. or youth club, um, and there's a story there as you would find out. Um, and Paul did, um, James and John, and and um, yeah, yeah, James and John, yeah, yeah, and Carlos and um, Dixon, right? Mm. Now, when you played there, we reached the final. We missed you dearly in the final. You missed the final. You know, we reached yeah. the final, right? I don't know why. Yeah. Again. And, I can't remember if it was injuries or what. Besides missing that final, you had a nice one in the semifinal. I wouldn't let you off the hook. You had a mm -hmm. head last post in the semifinal, man, to put away yeah. out of all wizards, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I asked you that. Yeah. <laughs> you remember the header, right? Hey, I mean, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. You went up the so, post. Yeah, yeah. I remember so that one. You you know what the mission was with North Scarborough? Mm -hmm. Going and help this young team in the MJ, right? Mm hmm Right, we reached the final, we won our tournament. What I understand from Byron now, you went back and coached North Scarborough. How did that evolve? Because you only have good reports <laughs> on you and you accomplish a lot in terms of winning. Oh, man. Uh, well, I, I thank God I thank God for that and just really the opportunity. Um, I think that came back maybe a, a year or so after that. I think I just saw Bart. Somebody had invited me. I don't know who it was. Maybe Jimmy, somebody. I went and watched the house league. I was watching or the, they had their soccer day. Something, just like a soccer Saturday mm -hmm. down by down by um, by Leacock there. You know, the field across the street from yeah. Leacock. So I was just watching them there. And Byron's like, you know, you should come coach his team. And I really want you to coach his team. He's coaching the team. And he's like, I need help. I'm the president. and I'm doing this. I need some help. So... I said, okay, you know what? I'll come watch the team play. I came back a week later, watched the team play. I said, hey, they're decent. They got some good players, and I don't mind helping out. So the next, so this was in maybe July or August. I said, Byron, September I'll come, right? When you start the new season, I'll come. 
no problem. I went, and at that point, I ended up just recruiting um, Mark Smith. So Bev, Bev Smith, who also helped me, Bev was also huge in my life. I used to jog to her house to take me to uh, to uh, training and games for for when I was playing for Scarborough, Missouri. So Miss Smith, she was there. She's like, oh, you know, you need to get Mark back into soccer. And Mark's not playing anymore. You know, he had his surgeries, doesn't play anymore. And Mark, and Mark was one of the greatest strikers we've seen from Melbourne. Played on the national team. Left foot was phenomenal. Him and Aaron B. So we used to say, Mark will hit with your left, Aaron will hit you with the right. Like, phenomenal. So I said, okay, no problem. So I got in touch with Mark. I said, Mark, I need an assistant coach. I got this team in Scarborough. We're going to coach North Scarborough. And we know the history of North Scarborough, North Scarborough and Agent Court. Right, yes. yes. So Mark actually used to play for Agent Court before. So when they came together with North Scarborough, he was like, okay, he'll jump back in. So we started coaching that team. Team was young, but there wasn't um, that many people. So we got a few players we coached for uh, the winter, the summer, the winter. The team used to get beat up. They weren't good. We used to get slaughtered. Ajax, everybody beat us up. 11 nothing. We're taking licks, real licks. I thought you started winning. I didn't know you had No, this. no, no. We're taking real licks. 11, 12, nothing. So then we merged one winter. We continue working with them. The kids develop. So one winter, we got together with Malvern because Malvern was struggling also for numbers. Mm-hmm. So we said, let's come together. So we played in the winter together, but there's a, a, a parent, I wouldn't even mention their name. The team was real good. So then the parent decides he's going to go to Malvern because he wants to coach. Because I said, well, no parent coaching. Me and Mark are coaching the team. Both of us, I don't have kids. So we, we don't have, um, there's no, we're not, there's no contradiction. Conflict, no, yeah, yeah. There's no conflict. There's no yeah. conflict of interest. It's all about the players. We want to develop them and make, make a good team. The guy took half the team and gone to Malvern. So we were left with five players, I remember. This was the turning point. Season begins May 2-4 weekend. First week of May, we only have five players. Byron's like, what are you guys going to do? I said, listen. I told the boys, I said, go. I go, boys, go to your schools. Talk to your friends. Who wants to come and play? It doesn't matter. As long as they're an athlete, just come play. We'll develop them. <laughs> So we get this one boy, Shedler. So Malcolm, Yuri Malcolm now, who also plays in, now he's in a scholarship in the States. He went and got his friend, Shedler. Shedler plays now, uh, plays football in the NCAA as well. So he plays American football. But Shedler came, strong black athlete. I was like, wow. Then another kid, Darwin, who just immigrated here from, um, from uh, Afghanistan or Iraq. He just came because of the war. We brought him in for out of house. We picked him out. He came. And now he's, he also has a scholarship. He's working to be a doctor. He's at Queen's University. On his third year, he's going to be a doctor. So Darwin came and he brought two of his friends, a skateboarder, one kid that played skateboard, one kid that was a hockey player, a goalie keeper in hockey. So we're like, okay, no problem. We got numbers. We got numbers coming. So the boys brought some of their friends. We said, we'll take everybody. We end up having 12 players. We're playing nine aside. We built from that. And we kept on building from that. Most of the boys end up staying. Then, you know, Kyle Kyle came down, Kyle Cohill. So Kyle's a referee now, coaches for me in Ajax as well. Kyle came down and a few of the boys came down. We end up building. By the time they were about 14, 15, the team started really coming together. And we got Young Peso came in from Jamaica, moved here. So we picked up Young Peso. And then we got Chris came from uh, Congo. They had moved here. They were new, looking for a club. He came. The kid had two left foot, you know. So, <laughs> but it was, but but he was fast and aggressive. We're like, the kid is fast as an athlete. They said we gotta work on him. So we had Chris. So you got, you got players just started coming, and we just developed them. And by the time the boys were 16, 17, they were forced to be reckoned with. And I remember the promotions going through CSL, going to OYSL, and just dominating the teams that used to beat us. I used to tell them, I said, boys, remember we lost 11 nothing to this team? Next year, we're dropping it down to five or even less. So it kept dropping down, dropping down. Mm-hmm. Then by the third year, it was like 1-1 one, one, or one nothing we lose. Or, you know, it's a tight game now. The team started winning. By the time they finished off at 18, it was one of the most recruited teams. We had about eight players being recruited for scholarships in the U.S. Unfortunately, with, with our boys and what we lack in our community, parents, people, they, they didn't take school serious 
So the school aspect of things, they lacked. So they, they couldn't get the scholarships because of grades. But being recruited by big schools, we won Ontario, we won Indoor Ontario Cup, we won a bunch of tournaments in the US. Like we went to Temple University and almost beat them. In the last tournaments, we ended up losing 5-1. But at 17 years old, playing grown men at 22, 23, and we end up losing 5-1, but we almost beat them. Went to Drexel, went to LaSalle. LaSalle was scared. They, we, so we lost two were, they, were those uh, showcase games you, you're taking them to the States to do? Is it showcase or just a tournament you're entering? No, these were showcase. So what happened was um, because of the tournaments we went to, the team was getting recognized. And then we played in uh, the Sigma showcase here. So a lot of the coaches started recognizing them. So one of the coaches from Temple said, listen, do you guys want to come down this spring and play us? Your team is really good. We would like to play you guys. So then I started arranging travel. Um, so then I started arranging travel um, for them. Mm -hmm. So they coach. So we arranged to play them, St. Joseph's. We played St. John. We'll go down to St. John's, go down to uh, play La Salle, Drexel. So we'd go down. We went down for seven days and we played all these teams. And so that's a way for the kids also to get recognized and the coaches to see you now at 17, 18 playing against 22-year-olds and 21-year-olds. How do you fit within their program? So the team did really well. Yeah. So, 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 those so are while they're looking, those coaches are also checking to see how the academics are. When they do see a player that they, they'll come and talk to you or somebody to find out where the academic level is, for you to know that Absolutely. some fall through the cracks because of academics. Absolutely. And... and, and that, see, that team was the first team that I experienced that with because we did all of that. Then I did it with Glenn Shields. I took some of my boys at Glenn Shields. We did the same thing. You went Glenn Shields um, after North Scarborough? Actually, you know what? It was in conjunction. I was coaching North Scarborough. When I, I picked up Glenn Shields when North Scarborough was 17, 18. So I was coaching Glenn Shields, the Glenn Shields boys as well, around the same time. So, so I was coaching... You OP. got your certification? You, you got certified? I got served. Yeah, I was coaching at OPDL at Glen Shields. You know, I, I give kudos to Dave Benning. Dave Benning helped me out with my National B. Um, you know, he mentored me a lot during my National B when I was doing it. I got my National B while, while I was with Glen Shields. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I was there and I was coaching Glen Shields. But at the same time, you know, I made Dave a deal. I said, listen, I'm going to coach your two OPDL teams at, at Glen Shields, but I can't leave my North Scarborough boys. This is my roots. I got to make sure that. I finished up with them until U18 at least. The boys get scholarships or they're done playing. And, you know, it's unfortunate. We didn't have U21 or men's league for them to go to. You know, I tried to branch them off, maybe send them to GS or something. Yeah. You know, but the, the connection, and that, that's a problem I said, you know, in Scarborough or the black community, where we're not connected together because really and truly my boys from North Scarborough, they should have been playing for GS. U21 and, yeah. and onward, representing yeah. GS. Because GS is the biggest club we have. So, so how, how, how come that mark was missed? What do what you figure caused that mark for missing that, that recruiting within that system? Is it is it um, the link not there, the communication breakdown? or? Well, well part, part of it, it, it's just communication though, and, and link. Because, because see, see, the problem is also, like I said, we, we tend to, Mitch, I'm going to be honest, we tend to, everybody wants to say, I own this, I own that. You know, Scarborough, right, right now, after this pandemic, we come through this, Scarborough is going to lose a lot of teams and lose a lot of players. But are Scarborough clubs willing to say, let's come together? So is Malvern and say, look, let's say Malvern or Scarborough, can they come together and make one club? I've been one trying big, that. I've been trying. Well, that's when I came but, but, those are, those are, with North Scarborough, I came from Malvern. To think, can, can Malvern and North Scarborough come together? Maybe, maybe even Scarborough Blizzard come together. So you have three clubs that come together. Change your name. Who cares? Call this Scarborough United. Who cares? Who cares about the name? Everybody cares about, well, no, no, this is our club. But you're losing players. You don't have a lot of cert. You don't have no certified coaches. You don't have quality. Forget even certified. Just quality coaches. Because back in the day, like Tony D, Randy, and Marvin, those guys were calling. They were, yeah. they were good. They, they, they didn't have licenses, but they knew what they were talking about. Exactly. But if you look at it now, the coaches that are coaching have, have no clue what they're talking about. So the, the question becomes, it's not even about the license. It's like, have you played? Are you studying the game? Are you giving the kids the right information? So why not just come together and build one club and then connect that club to GS? GS is the only men's 
or the only big club in Scarborough. So just connect it to GS. Yes, who, I think who so. Cares, who cares who gets the glory? The problem is that everybody wants to get the glory, but but we all end up not getting any glory. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We end you know, up everybody up wants the glory, but yeah. Yeah, everybody wants the glory, but nobody's getting the glory because you got maybe four or five good players in North Scarborough, four or five good players in, in, in Melbourne, four or five players in, in uh, Scarborough Blizzard or, or West Rouge. So they're all scattered. Bring them together. So that opened the, the, the way for where you are now, seeing that you just put that on the table. I understand <laughs> you are with Ajax. And yeah. uh, you hold a, a serious person after winning. I guess you're moving up. Everybody's uh, taking a look at you. So I no, I've bounced around. I've been around. I've been yeah, around. Yeah. So, so uh, you're with Ajax. And what is your position now at Ajax? What, well, what now at Ajax, oh. well, I'll give you a little bit. I bounced around. I've been in the OPDL since inception. I was at Markham for a little bit. I was, well, I started with North Toronto. I was at Markham. I went to Glen Shields. I went to North Mississauga, Brampton. So coming to Ajax, now, you know, I'm lucky where the GM has given me the opportunity, Richard Carey has given me the opportunity to become a director of player development. So pretty much like a TD role. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just design programs for, for the uh, players. So I'm responsible for the boys program. I do, I do help with the girls program and work with them as well, do the coaching. But, but my, 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 my primary role is with the boys program. So in the boys program, all the all the age groups from U6 to men's or U21 is going to be under my umbrella. So for me to build and develop those programs for the players. So for me, I'm looking to work together. We have a, you know, Ajax is very a very diverse community, mm -hmm. and we know, but there's a lot of players from a lot of people from Ajax that grew up in Scarborough, and I've come yes. across. Yes. So I understand the dynamics. But for me, it's really about developing the players, developing the club, and bringing a sense of pride and high performance level. Now, we're saying, okay, we're not just a community club. Let's be a high performance club where we're going to develop our players. Uh, over the years, I've had many connections. I've, um, I've met, uh, you know, Andrew Ornock introduced me to a good guy that me and I, him have become very, very good friends in Holland, CO10 Cat. So I'm in Holland a lot. You know, before the pandemic, I was there twice a year. You know, every time we did a camp here together, I go to FC20, I go to Ajax a lot. I go to, we've gone to Groningen. So I know I know the directors at Groningen and at FC20. I have a direct phone call to them now. And that's because of just the connection. And that's what I'm trying to reach back to Ajax now. It's like, can I get our players and develop them and give them opportunity where if you're good enough, which maybe 1%, or even less than 1% may mm -hmm. make it. But yeah. still give them give them that option to, hey, or even go visit and get an experience. But it also give them an incentive too. So they might be their better self, whether they can make it or not, they will be better for it after your training. So that's, you kind of preempt my next question, which when <laughs> you mentioned you were 6 to 21, right? I was going to yeah. ask you because you, prior to that, you was mentioning about the communication or the link with the GS or whatever, because it's kind of sad what I'm noticing for you to put all our work in between the six and 21. You have this mm -hmm. within those windows, you have the scholarship. Yeah, you yep. might have to a local tournament to give them the incentive. And then you have the sourcing to Holland and Europe, right? Yeah. So you said 1% maybe less. What about those once they start reaching the 21 now? Are you working on that also that, you know? Well, we're we'll, we'll trying for me. I mean, for me, again, my mandate here is, is to develop the club and develop the young players. For me, honestly, I'm not even looking at the professional aspects. I'm saying, can we get them scholarships? Can I create a program? I'm trying to create a scholarship program here as we did, as we helped create in Brampton. What I saw Dave do at Glen Shields, what I see, you know, other clubs are doing now, you know, even what Patrice and these guys are doing in Vaughan. The majority of the players, when they first started off, came from Scarborough or from Durham, right? So we understand that and see that. So for me, at the end of the day, is like, can we create something here in the Durham where Scarborough's close? So instead of the Scarborough players heading out to York Region, come over here and be a part of this. So we're trying to create avenues. You know, I've, I've made a ton of connections to the U.S., so a ton of scholarships, you know, scholarship uh, opportunities we have there as well. Mm -hmm. Whether it be D1, D2, D3, 
uh, you, you need to go to NIA because, or you need to go to junior college because your grades weren't good. All those connections are all there as well, right? So to give the kids more opportunities to experience something different in life, um, you know, that's something I'd love to establish and what we're trying to actually build, at least what I'm, what I foresee in the future, mm -hmm. what I would like to do. So that's the goal. The professional route, yeah, it's there. But when you really think about it, the percentage of players that actually make it, it's very, it's very low. So for me, I don't, I don't want to sell that dream of you're going to go pro. I'd rather sell you the dream that I'll get your scholarship. That's more likely. Which, may, which is really the better thing because now they have an education and, and, and they yeah. more than likely have a job in case of injury. Exactly. And you could always go pro after that too. But I mean, again, if you're there, that less than 1% that's really talented and you have it going, then yeah, nobody's going to stop you. But the majority of kids really, hey, continue playing, love the game, enjoy the game. And okay, maybe go pro. I remember, you know, that's one thing Patrick told me. He goes, when I, when I got into coaching, he brought me to coaching. He goes, Paul, if you're really going to take coaching seriously, think about two things. You're either going to help your kids go to get a scholarship or help them go pro. Otherwise, don't bother coaching. And it was rough for me that way. I, said, I thought back. I said, okay, that makes sense. I said, well, if I'm not going to help you, so those are two things going to help you. I'll help you become better and love. And now, you know, they change the game. Help them just love the game. This, this thing about uh, just, you know, soccer for life. Yeah. Great. But if you have a passion, like I come, home, I come from Africa. I love the game since I was like two years old. So for me, it's soccer for life. I don't know anything else. I don't need to be taught to love the game for life. For me, I want to be a professional. I want yeah. to be, my dream was to play a pro. A scholarship was secondary. I didn't care about that. It was to play pro. So, you know, for me, it's hard for me to tell a kid that don't dream to play pro. Go ahead and dream. Yeah. But know that you got to work. You got to work really hard to get to, to get, play at that level. Okay. And you know? one intangible before we close. Mm. Uh, hearing it from, you know, others who've been that route or had children that been that route. The adaptability of being away from home and Paul, you're a good candidate to toughen the kids up because looking at your background, seeing that you had to move away from your homeland, mm -hmm. talking about the people who helped you along the way and stuff. You have a good story to tell your, the, the players under you, the people that you're coaching and mm -hmm. as far as I'm hearing, a lot feel not by ability, but it's just that commitment and that missing home you know, they're saying you can spoil your kids, but if they want to be pro, as you just said, they have to be able from an early age to know what it's like to be away from home. Um, no home cooking. Mommy can go, <laughs> daddy can come once every month or two months or whatever. You can do that. Are you training mentally? Are you seeing that, that adaptability skills too? Uh, I mean... I'm trying to 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 help the parents. I, I, most of my kids, whenever we go to tournaments, I tell them that. I so I have a rule whenever we travel. When they get to a certain age, I, I think I started with it, with them at 13. We travel. If we travel anywhere, stay in a hotel. It's four players to a room. No parents, cell phones, and anything, any gaming stuff. Come to to my room or, or to the assistant coach. There's there is curfew, and this and that. So trying to teach them how to just manage that and you're not with your parents, parents can stay in the hotel but they're not they're, you have no access to them you're on your own you eat meals with the team you do this and I, I remember you know one time one of the girls when we went I mean the parents had you know I had female parents with chaperones and she was crying she's like well she didn't want to give up her phone I said well you have two options you don't give up your phone you don't play tomorrow plain and simple I go out of 18 girls one is saying no 17 gave up their phone i go i don't need you to play so you got to think about that and it's the same girl that wants to go far i go you want to go far but yet you're attached to your phone you're attached to mommy and daddy it's okay you know so th there's a lot of stories i give them and i talk to them and talk to the players you know there's a, uh, a, a lady right now i'm helping her son and talk to her son. son's very good young kid he's 10 he's 11 years old and has a European passport and everything. He speaks languages for it. I said, take the kid over. He's very good. I said, give him a different environment. Well, you know, the, she, he needs to kind of 
they're still very attached, you know? Yeah. You need to grow up and be independent and whatnot. But I said, well, how are you going to allow him to be independent if you're not going to let him go? Let him loose. Yeah, because that's the only way he can make it. That's the only way he's going to learn. I'm finding all the prerequisites for Europe and this place. They can't go at 16. No, no. Saying that, going to Holland and, and, and learning a lot more when I started going the last few years and even developing myself as a coach, I learned that they said, so my buddy, he looked at, we went, I watched FC20 train. I watched Ajax train. I watched Groningen train. Watch even AZ. So I was like, watching these teams train and watching them, the boys, the young boys even, the 10s, 11, 12s. He said, you know what? I was, I'm looking, I said, our boys can compete with these guys. He said, that's not the problem, Paul. He said, he goes, I've come to Canada, in Toronto, I've trained players, I've done camps. He goes, you guys are really good. You're talented. You're good up to the age of 15. He said, what happens after 15? He goes, is there, the coaches can't develop the players better? Like, what happens? He goes, the kids are athletic. They're skillful. They know football up to 15. But after 15, something happens. It's true. That's true. So, so when you look at it, it's like, well, after 15, what's going on? Our kids, are, our kids are caught up into girls. Our boys are caught up into girls in yeah. high school. Yeah. There's other sports are caught up into basketball, other sports. Um, and then there's no professional league or dreams or aspirations to make it pro. If you think about it in Toronto, how big Toronto is, how much talent has come out of Toronto. You look at Canada, the professional players that have come out of Canada, how many of them come from Toronto or the GTA. And we have one big professional team, TFC. How many of those boys are going to play at TFC? Exactly. And then saying play MLS. So it's like, and when you're dreaming, aspiring to go play in Europe, you know, you need more options. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so when you don't have that either, and then and then and then you look at the training environments we have. You know, people. So just to finish off, Mitch, people knock on OPDL. OPDL is not bad though. They actually, the I think what they wanted to create was good in terms of an environment. Yes, take away cost. Mm -hmm. Cost, yes, the big deal. But in terms of the environment, training four or five days a week, playing a game. You have a game. That's the same model in Europe, you know. Guys train Monday to Friday. Well, there's, game no, Saturday. there's no substitute for training. You can't. Right, you, train, no. you train Monday. You train Monday to Friday. You play Saturday. This midweek game where I'm training and I got a game Tuesday, Thursday. I got a game Wednesday, and all this. Oh, I'm only training twice a week, but I got to train on this patch of grass. Or next week we're training on this field. No, no, no. Like, give me one yeah. field. Let me train. I know where I'm coming and I'm training here. We don't have that. We don't have that kind of structure in Canada. So it's not knocking anybody, but we just don't have that structure in Canada. Right? Yeah. Well, I'm hearing that all over the place. Well, Paul. Um. So I almost call you the technical director. Um. Give me that <laughs> description again because you say it's like the TD, but I want to make it, sure I have the quotation right. It's director of player development for the boys. Director of player development. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the boys. Yeah. But I, I didn't. It's like the TD. <laughs> it's like the technical director because there's no technical director right there's no td no we don't have right. a td okay um so well, paul thanks for giving me the time you have done well um i'm glad i get this from you i was really pursuing you but Toronto <laughs> is a busy guy or whatever you know and um yes i do have the metro lines here all right all right, all right. Uh, after you kids. after you send it and um I do have right. it for some of the guys from Metro Lions. This is the last set I have here. And okay. again, it was nice having you. And I wish you continued success. And you stay safe. I appreciate it, Mitch. Thanks to you as well. You did a great job. Thank you for the interview. And um, you know what? It's great work. It's really just to get uh, the word out in the community for what we're doing. And I appreciate it as well. I appreciate right. you and thank you as well. All right.